Okay. So continuing on with the citric acid cycle. So two pyruvate uh, molecules from glycolysis are transported into the mitochondria. And that's the location of the, like, the cel cellular respiration. Let me get a highlighter here. Cellular respiration. So if oxygen is available, aerobic respiration will go forward. And that process is shown here at the beginning of the pyruvic acid loses one single carbon in form of CO2 while combining with coenzyme A, and that requires energy, uh, the re reduction of NADH, reduction to NADH, rather. So it loses CO2 in a, a step one, and then two carbon acetyl group, that's this group here, is the one that um, is attached to carrier coenzyme A, which is derived from vitamin B5. And the resulting acetyl-CoA is what enters the citric acid cycle. And the citric acid cycle is named after the citric acid. And the, once it occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria, and it's a closed loop, meaning it recycles, regenerates the oxaloacetate that is used in the first step. That's what it means to be closed to move. So the acetyl-CoA enters the matrix and combines with oxaloacetate to form the citric acid. That's the namesake. And the CoA, coenzyme A, is then free to combine with more acetyl groups from the uh, glycolysis. <laughs> And the last step of the cycle regenerates the oxaloacetate. Total three NADH, one FDH, two, and one ATP has been produced in a citric acid cycle. So here, here are the three NADHs, FDAD, FADH2, and of course ATP. And meanwhile, two molecules of CO2 is released. This is why we breathe out CO2. That's the entire point. And these NADH, FADH2, will later enter the oxidative phosphorylation. So far, at the termination of citric acid cycle, all six carbons from the glucose has been released as CO2. You only saw three, but that's from one single pyruvate molecule and glucose produces two. So same, but the process repeats for the other, the other pyruvate. And the step that generates the most ATP is called the oxidative phosphorylation. It uses electron transport chain and O2 as the terminal electron receptor. This is why we breathe in O2. It uses protein complexes in the inner membrane, inner boundary membrane, inner membrane, inner membrane here. This is the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And this is where we, what we talked about, the plasma membrane being uh, fluidic is very beneficial because all of these electron transport chain molecules must float and collide with each other. That's what uh, carries out the transfer of electrons. And the energy of the electrons form the, what we call electrochemical gradient. And it occurs across the inner, mem uh, uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. And the potential energy stored in this, in this gradient is what generates the ATP. And the entirety of uh, this process is it's just called oxidative phosphorylation, which include electron transport chain as well as chemiosmosis. And total ATP yields varies theoretically 36 to 38 ATPs are possible. A uh, little redox chemistry. Leo goes ger, lose an electron, you are oxidized. Gain on the electron, you are reduced. 
so this some hypothetical compound or uh, uh, atom A becomes A plus by losing an electron. But hypothetical ion A minus can also lose an A electron and become neutral A. Same thing for gaining an electron B, gains an electron and becomes B minus. Or B minus can gain another electron and become B two plus. So NAD plus gaining an electron and becoming NADH, is that oxidation or reduction? It gained an electron, so it's a reduction. What about FADH2 losing two electrons and two protons? Well, that's obviously losing an electron, so it's an oxidation. So both NADH and FADH2 are oxidized in electron transport chain. And the pumped in proton creates this electrochemical gradient, or we call it also proton motive force. It's a force that, uh, think, of, think of many positive charges that are repelling each other out here in this space. They're all repelling each other. It has to go someplace and it's forced through a very small hole we call ATP synthase. So the proton gradient that is set up across the inner mitochondrial membrane in the inter-membrane uh, space is what generates the ATPs. And the electron transport chain is the last component of aerobic respiration, and it is the only step that uses CO2. And the electrons from NADH and FADH2 are passed along the protein, uh, protein complexes that are embedded in the plasma membrane. Here's one, two, three, and four complexes. It also uses hydride ion. Most people skip it for simplicity because I mean, negative charges. Hydrogen, what does it mean? It means it has two. Uh, electrons. So as hydride is pumped through the complex one, complex one here, this is, um, it, it's uh, the complex one will strip the electrons, in this case two, because it's a hydride ion, and it then pumps in the proton into the intermembrane space, is, which is up here. Matrix is down here. So matrix is down here, inner membrane. This is the inner membrane. Out here is the intermembrane space. FADH2 uh, becomes FAD and two plus by complex three, not as shown here by complex two. Each oxidation of NADH and FADH uh, is coupled to the protons being pumped into the inter-membrane space. This should be inter, made a mistake here. <clears throat> Eventually in complex four, complex four, electron is accepted by the oxygen and that's what's occurring here. Or here too. Two protons plus half of O2 is producing one water molecule. And why do you think the oxygen is the uh, electron acceptor? Because oxygen is one of the most electronegative atoms element. So then chemiosmosis must occur. Chemiosmosis is, the, is using the potential energy of the proton gradients that's set up in the intermembrane space and make ATP using the ATP synthase is shown here. So protons are moving through the ATP synthase and turning ATADP and inorganic phosphate into ATP. And uh, we say proton is diffused through the, through the ATP synthase. What kind of uh, diffusion should this be? This should be, this should be facilitated diffusion as we have seen before. And this is where the idea of proton motive force becomes important because it's the ATP 
synthase is the hole in the membrane that protons are forced through by the proton motive force. Chemiosmosis generates 90% of ATP from aerobic catabolism of glucose and the electron transport chain and the chemiosmosis collectively is called the oxidative phosphorylation. Um, fermentation, so aerobic respiration requires obviously oxygen, the final electron receptor. And ATP is produced by high energy electrons carried by NADH and FADH2 using electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. But if there is no O2 or no oxygen, what happens? NADH must be reoxidized to NAD plus, otherwise glycolysis can occur, can't occur. In fermentation, uh, organisms use organic molecules as the final electron receptor. And then and aerobic respiration uses inorganic molecules. In animals and bacteria, muscle, uh, if you work out, your muscle aches, right? And if you take milk and culture it with some bacteria, you get yogurt. How does that occur? It's in muscles, the pyruvic acid is converting NADH and making NAD plus so that glycolysis can continue. But that press process is what creates the lactic acid. That's why your muscles are sore. The lack of O2 shunts pyruvate from entering the citric cycle, and instead it makes the lactic acid in your cells. And that, re that reproduces NAD+, which is needed for glycolysis. How does um, creatinine or creatine supplements work? They are made up of phosphocreatine, and the phosphocreatine donates its own phosphate to ADP. Then what happens? Well, you make ATP. Another uh, example of fermentation is alcohol fermentation and anaerobic cellular respiration. Alcohol is produced from pyruvate in absence of O2. So here's pyruvate uh, releasing one CO2 and creating a acetaldehyde. And it's the acetaldehyde that regenerates the NAD plus for the glycolysis. And the byproduct of that is ethanol. And if the CO2 is not vented, it makes the drink fizzy. This is how beer is fizzy. Why is the natural limit of alcohol content 12% like we talked about last night? Is 12% alcohol safe level for living yeast? It's obviously not. That's why the limit is, there's a limit to the concentration of alcohol. Hand sanitizers are typically anywhere from 60 to 90%, but they're only working externally. So they have to um, sterilize the uh, germs from outside, which is different from internal alcohol content. Anaerobic cellular respiration is used by some bacteria in archaea. There's one archaea called methanogens, which reduces CO2 to methane to oxidize the NAD to NAD plus to be used in glycolysis. Some sulfate reducing microorganisms will reduce sulfates to hydrogen sulfide and generate NAD plus from NADH. And obviously, glucose, glucose metabolism and many other metabolism are interconnected to each other. Oh, 
So take a turkey sandwich, for instance. It's yummy. It has carbs, proteins, fats, green stuff. Some carbohydrates and amino acids and glycerols and things, they can enter glycolysis by being modified in certain ways. Some fatty acids and some amino acids can enter pyruvate oxidation step. And some amino acids can be converted to enter the citric acid cycle. And all of them will shuttle into the oxidative phosphorylation. So all the catabolic pathways using macromolecules connect to glycolysis, citric acid cycle. And that includes sugars, proteins, and lipids.